Some call me Steve, Dad, Husband or Friend. Others might call me Boss, Coach or Mentor. Today you can call me the Leadership Hacker. Thanks for listening in, I really appreciate it. My job as the Leadership Hacker is to hack into the minds, experiences, habits and learning of great leaders, C-suite executives, authors and development experts so that I can assist you developing your understanding and awareness of leadership. I'm Steve Rush and I'm your host today. I'm the author of Leadership Cake. I'm a transformation consultant and leadership coach and can't wait to start sharing all things leadership with you. Our special guest on today's show is Matt May. He's the founder and CEO of Premier Team Building, an interactive experiences company. He's also a speaker and author of the book, Take the Fear of Team Building. But before we get a chance to speak with Matt, it's a Leadership Hacker News. Do values and culture play a real part in leadership post-pandemic? Well, we're going to look at how environments have changed dramatically over the last 10 years, and particularly since the pandemic. It's exposed weaknesses and, for some businesses, strengths in the effectiveness of company values and how they're put into practice. I want to dive in and have a quick look at how leadership drastically changes company culture and how values inform it. There's a fantastic report from the ILM called Leading Through Values, if you get a chance to get your hands on it, which gives you much more context and detail about the things I'm going to talk to you about. And just to throw something else into the mix that helps inform culture and values right now, I wrote an article in CEO World magazine and on LinkedIn called Mind the Gen Gap. For the first time, we now have four generations in the workforce, baby boomers, Gen Xers, millennials, and Gen Zers, or Gen Zers if you're in the UK. And the reason this is important is because values are the principles, the rules of the game, and we all have perspectives based on our generations. And whilst these are not scientifically proven, it's a good barometer and we should take it into consideration. The ILM research found that 69% of people will reconsider a job if the company culture seems to be toxic. 77% felt that company culture was incredibly important to them and the values that their boss also brings to the culture. And 56% ranked opportunities for growth as more important than their basic salary and package. So the top values that impact on culture are having a person-centered and authentic approach with the core elements being congruence. In other words, your words and actions make sense to your employees, being genuine in essence. Empathy, having a deep understanding of what it feels like for employees of every grade and every level. And an unconditional positive regard for the individual And only if there is a genuine approach to demonstrate these values from senior leadership, there can be congruency throughout the organisation. You would expect well-being of employees to be up there, and of course it is. The Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development, CIPD, ran a survey of over 3,000 individuals in the UK. And the survey consistently found that 38% of workers experience work stress on a weekly basis. The problem in a lot of companies is that there is no clear standalone health and well-being strategy. In fact, only 8% of companies had such a strategy. And at least 34% of managers expressed the need for independent authority and feel unempowered to really do anything. My observation here is if we have a people-centered approach, well-being should be part of that. And we don't necessarily need to have a strategy or strategic. We do, however, need to be more thoughtful and compassionate. And as a talent management and learning and development professional, it's music to my ears to see self-directed and autonomous learning to sit up here in the top tier. There's been a significant shift away from organisations investing in organisation-wide learning programmes and much more focused self-directed autonomous learning. And it's becoming more prominent in most companies' culture. And this means that the company values are the basis of helping employees engage when it's meaningful and when it's right for them. But this strategy provides some challenges too. Some people really struggle to learn on their own. They do need guidance, support and others to help them on their journey. There are people not able to extract and absorb the information in the same way and still need that face-to-face facilitator-led sessions. And there's such a thing too to have too much freedom. 
the number of possibilities can create overwhelm and anxiety, so we have to sometimes help people direct them to the most appropriate resources. And the last one on my list today is recognition. Remuneration is important for sure, but recognizing staff for good jobs well done is most important and a significant indicator in values-based leadership. Many employees want to feel that their work has been valued and valuing values plays an important role in this because they should stipulate in some way that there is a recognition of the hard work outside of the salary and the direct results as a result of their work. This will also inform great culture and culture can be formed so that this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The final thing I want to draw our attention to is your company's purpose is not your purpose and your mission, but finding that connectivity by what you do to why they do what they do will really help you find true purpose in your work as well as in your life. A values-based culture gives you the principles that will accelerate progress together and purpose will anchor the activities that bring people together to drive great culture. That's been the Leadership Pack in News. Let's dive into the show. Joining me on the show today is Matt May. He's the founder and CEO of Premier Team Building, an interactive experiences company who's putting the fun and energy back into play. He's also a speaker and author of the book, Take the Fear Out of Team Building. Matt, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. So I'm really looking forward to our interactive experience today. But before we get into that, maybe you can just give our listeners a little bit of the the journey from where it all began in theatre to you and how you ended up running an interactive experiences firm. Absolutely. Uh, so I, I went, I was in music and theater in uh, high school, middle school. Uh, I always was creative. Hey, let's put on some sort of a, a show or a presentation or do something for the family and the parents and the yada yada in the backyard and the garage. Um, and when I went to school, undergraduate, I went for theater. I earned a dual major in theater and arts administration. So I got that business side. I also was a camp counselor when I was a teenager. I went through a three-year counselor and training program as a camper, um, took some psychology courses in undergrad, as well as a number of leadership courses. And, and I don't know if they're called seminars or, or what, but uh, opportunities that were presented through a variety of organizations with, uh, within the university setting. So that that kind of all sort of came together together for me after i graduated school i went to new york city and did the professional entertainment thing for a while but i also was always kind of had an education thought in my head so i really did a number of different things i i finally left new york after five years i said i'm i'm moving to sunnier pastures because i want to be able to have my coffee outside whether it's january or june that's so, right yeah <laughs> I moved to Florida in the States um, and and really haven't looked back. But when I moved there, I started working in administration at a performing arts high school and college and did a number of different had a number of different opportunities that I embraced and, and did. And finally, uh, sort of fell into team building per se. I happened to be bartending at uh, a, a comedy show on campus at the Fort Lauderdale Performing Arts Center, the Broward Center for the Performing Arts. And um, the stage manager happened to be staffing an event, a team building event, just helping the company, which is actually based in Massachusetts, so not even close by. And she said, hey, do you want to do it? And I said, yeah, absolutely. And that was my first official team building as an assistant staff. And I said, oh, huh, there's something about this. So jump ahead. Several years I w- uh, was facilitating. I started doing a lot of producing because of my theater background. I was able to do production and logistics and whatnot. And finally said, you know what? I, I quite honestly, I'm tired of being on the front lines and not having control and what goes into all of the preparation beforehand and created my own company. And I like to call it a perfect storm because I have my logistics and my business and my my entrepreneurship and my sales skills and, and by the way sales is my least favorite thing to do but I, I guess i have some sort of a knack for it but then i also when i facilitate jump on stage and i'm able to get people working together and be entertaining and whatnot so i'm able to 
use all of my experiences and all of my different training, whether it be from education or professional or theater or business, and it kind of a perfect storm collides together. So it, that's kind of how I got to where I am now. And looking back, of course, hindsight is always twenty twenty. I think, oh, all right, well, that's why I did all of those different things and worked in education and the professional theater and, you know, did some temping in offices and whatnot so that all of this came together for me to where I am now. Steve Jobs, I think, famously said, you can't always connect the dots forward, but you can definitely connect them back. And that's a perfect example, right? If you were trying to create the path to where you are now, you'd probably never get there. No, and and I, you just made me think, I don't know uh, if I'm the only one, but I remember as a kid when we would try to do mazes, you know, the mazes that you draw the pen or the pencil through it all. Yeah. For some reason, they seem to be easier going backwards. Oh, that's an interesting perspective. I wonder if that's something to do with the way that our brains are wired as well. It must be. I've never really researched it. And until you mentioned that Steve Jobs quote, I hadn't really thought of it, but I think that's on my to-do list this afternoon. So there's a <laughs> shout out to all our amateur neuroscientists or any professional ones that listen to the show. They can maybe contact us and let us know. That'd be interesting to have a look at. Yes. So the work that you do now, it's very still very theatrical, isn't it? So you get to be that front of stage guy, but also then be that production guy as well is there a natural kind of thing that you prefer are you more of a front man or more of a production man where where would you say your kind of true passion lie I that's that's a tough question to answer um you know certainly being a performer as I was younger and going to school for it initially that's instilled in me but it's funny I will have clients who are new clients often come up to me after an experience has ended and say, where did you come from? And the first few times that happened, I didn't understand it, but now I do. When I walk into a a ballroom or whatever, and I'm setting up and managing staff and we're getting ready, it's very organized and logical. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just doing what needs to be done. And I'm talking to a client or whatever, and it's very professional. But something happens that when I jump on stage or jump in front of a crowd or grab a mic or whatever, I just inherently turn it on, if you will. Yeah. And that's what they refer to. Now, the challenge is in, in my line of work is I'm not there just to entertain, right? It's all about, and I'm reminded of the late Alex Trebek from Jeopardy. He uh, was never wanted to be introduced as the star of the show Jeopardy. It was always the host of the show because his feeling was that contestants were the stars. And I try to keep that philosophy that the participants in the experience, they are the stars. The light shines on them. When I start a program, I'm doing kind of what I like to think of as audience warm up. And yeah, I do my shtick and whatnot, but that gets people going. But then once the experience really gets going and they get hands on, it's all about them. Yeah. And of course, the biggest thing most of all is you're there to facilitate a learning outcome. Exactly. And that's the one thing that is different from a performance, because actually, as a performer, you're still having an ambition to want to entertain, but you're not having to be as thoughtful of the specific way that you construct an experience so that somebody takes away a different learning outcome, right? Correct. Correct. And and when we're watching as patrons watching entertainment, whether it be on a screen or on a stage, that's, you know, our, our, we are there for them to entertain us. Where in my line of work, it's, I'm not here to entertain you. As you said, I'm here to facilitate the experience. So you put in as much as you're going to get out of it. Exactly right. So when we start to think about the whole concept of team building, when you mention that word to groups of individuals, What's the reason you get a different response? So some people will love it and some people will run in fear from it. What causes that? I, uh, the simple answer, in my opinion, is bad experiences. Yeah. They have, been, they have been thrust into experiences that were not positive, didn't have positive outcomes for them for whatever reason. It could be, you know, so many people think of team building as trust falls or paintball 
or zip lining or whitewater rafting, you know, extreme sports, if you will, or sitting in a room and being told, this is how you work together as a team while watching a, a slideshow, right? I don't do any of those things. And I think it's because people have been thrust into those things or that's the majority of their experience. They just have a negative connotation in their head that team building is a bad word. Now, there's also, as you mentioned, some people are very excited about it. People who are extroverted and tend to be, uh, well, extroverts generally like it more because they're excited and their, their energy is locomotive full speed ahead, where people who are more introverted and maybe have anxiety, or even if it's not full-blown anxiety, just don't like to be in a crowd or don't like to be in a small group because they can't hide as easily, those people have uh, more apprehension. So when they hear team building, I think their uh, negative thoughts are even more heightened. Of course, in any audience, you're going to have a mix of those types of individuals because many will be extroverted and thinkers and feelers and others will be introverted thinkers and feelers. How do you make sure that when you're constructing a session that you're thoughtful of those different types of personalities that might come out? Well, uh, our experiences are designed in such a way that everybody is is even on an even keel, uh, equal, right? I generally tell clients, I don't want to know who the boss is. Don't tell me. The CEO is here. Okay, great. Don't tell me who he is or she is. I don't want to know because I want to treat every single person the same. Now, Murphy's Law inevitably comes into play nine times out of 10, and that's the person I wind up picking on <laughs> just organically. And then I, now, oh, that's the CEO. Well, thanks for playing. <laughs> but um, generally, most of our experiences, Steve, call for teams of 10. And we start off having everybody in the team of 10 doing a group exercise and they're all doing the exact same thing before they even break out into quote unquote, and I'm using air quotes here, roles uh, and responsibilities that they will be in charge of, if you will, during the experience, everybody does the same icebreakers and the same um, introductory games and challenges and activities so that everyone is completely even keel. Then a lot of times, when you break off into the experience, uh, say it's building bikes for kids, uh, for example, some people are more mechanically inclined, inclined or they're really good with wrenches and they want to put something together. Great. Somebody else is better with puzzles and mind games and mind solving. Great. They'll focus more on that. Other people are better at marketing. And so they'll kind of work on, on their team presentation more. But by the same token, a lot of times people say, you try this. This is not your forte or what you would normally gravitate to this particular uh, component. Why don't you try this? And that allows people to see their colleagues in a whole different light. Yeah. For example, sometimes the CEO or the C-levels or the directors, whatever, will be on teams with somebody who's the front desk receptionist. And that person will, what for whatever reason, wind up in more of a leadership role or whatnot. And then next thing you know, the boss is saying, you are totally underutilized signing for packages and answering the phone. We need to talk next week. And, you know, ultimately the person becomes an office manager or whatever because he or she was seen in a different light. I suspect that having the opportunity to throw away the natural conventions of the work labels gives everybody the opportunity to see how others behave and perform. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. So as kids, when, you know, you first got up in front of your folks and did your, you know, theatre production and, you know, probably did the same, what is it that causes some people like you, Matt, to continually have this energy to want to continually innovate and play, where others like me will, will you know, be a bit stuffy and go, well, I, you know, I don't do any of that kind of stuff anymore? Well, I don't know... I... I don't know if there's a certain quote unquote thing that is in me or not in you or whatever. Um, I, I think some of it is inherent and it's personality and as well as, as likes and desires, you know, what we follow or, or chase. But I think a big part of it too, Steve, is that we are conditioned as we grow up 
Now, I can only speak for the states, right? I can't speak for European school uh, upbringing, but for the states, and, and this is changing to a degree, but for so long, it was sit at the desk, take the information that's presented to you, go home, do some exercises, commit it to memory, come back and regurgitate, wash, rinse, repeat, right? Right. So, and, and what is, as kids, if we look at it, their favorite, well, I'm generalizing, often the favorite part of the day is recess because they get to go outside and play. Mm. But as we get older, recess is removed from the school day. And by the time we're in, in out of primary schools and into middle school, junior high, high school, and then certainly in college, we go and are, we ask people to give us information and educate us that we are then going to theoretically use, but the play is gone. So I think that's a big part of it is just society. And don't get me wrong. Look, I, adulting is hard. <laughs> okay. <laughs> true. We all have responsibilities. We can't play on the playground all day. We have to work so that we can survive and support our family. Or if we don't have a family, at least keep a roof over our head and, and, keep us fed and clothed, but the fun element in our work and our work day seems to have been removed. Yeah. And it it takes like going on a boys weekend to have um, our fun or the girls, I'm going out with the girls tonight or whatever. That is how we have our fun. Well, why can't we still have fun in the work day? And I know fun is not necessarily uh, something we use to to measure success or productivity, but it doesn't mean it can't be prevalent, and it doesn't mean it doesn't help success and productivity. I think you actually might be able to measure that. So when you look at things like employee engagement, you'll see fun represent itself in different ways. So commitment to the organization, prepared to stay, creativity, innovation, elements of peer group recognition that kind of stuff but often we don't apply that three-letter word to it because we feel it's got less relevance in a workplace correct would that be fair so much absolutely i think that's very fair and and i will let you in on well i guess it's not going to be a secret because i've already told other people (laughs) coming out there right now i am a hallmark movie junkie i fully admit it i'm a sap i'm a big romantic at heart i love hallmark movies and there was one that I watched about a year ago now, and there was a line that I sort of kind of touched on a moment ago, but the, te- the line was, and I know that fun isn't typic metric in the corporate world, but you know what it's worth, because fun allows people to relax and be fully themselves, which makes them productive and more engaged, and that affects the bottom line. Right. And is that something also that helps remove some of that fear and anxiety around team building as well. Absolutely. And, and I've had, I don't want to say arguments, discussions with people who have said uh, anything competitive is not valuable in team building. Well, hold on. Going back to the whole paintball, I will agree with you on that. I don't, for me, that is not exciting. That is not team building. That's just crazy, whatever. However, the majority of our team building experiences are competitive in nature. However, we're not talking about tackling each other and taking each other out with guns. We're talking about lighthearted competition. And if you if you instill that, people are naturally competitive, Steve, right? It's mm-hmm. again, I'm generalizing, but for the most it's a fair generalization. But yeah. when we start we go to school, we earn or we are provided with good grades for positive work and productive work. The mother of all, and I don't know if you have this over in the UK, but at least over here, the mother of all winnings is the lottery. People play lotto, whether it's scratch off or the big one. People go to a casino for a night out, whatever, but they put their coin in the machine, pull that lever, and they want to get the payout. We are competitive. We like to win things. So when you tell people, hey, you are doing this for the winning title. And yes, you're going to win a gold medal at the end, whatever. It's just fun. We're just there to have some lighthearted competition. But people inherently enjoy that. Then they start 
talking smack to their colleagues. You're going down, whatever. Just again, it's all lighthearted fun. Nobody really means any ill will to each other, but doing that in, in an environment outside of the office allows you to see your colleagues in a different light. And neurologically, of course, it releases dopamine. Correct. And that's a reward chemical transmitter, neurotransmitter that we thrive on. And you get a hit from that. So not only is it fun, it's also alluring. So you want more of it. Exactly. We crave more of it once we've had once we've had the burst of it. And yeah. like I said, the, the whole metals, I have a discussion and I usually talk about it on when to do uh, team building exercises. I always say if you have people that don't know each other and coming out of the pandemic, I have, hear from more and more people, we're doing this sales meeting and 75% of our team has not met each other other than on Zoom. Okay, well, then I would recommend doing it at the beginning. Well, we wanted to wrap up the three-day conference with it. Okay, we can do that. But if you're telling me people don't know each other yet, do it at the beginning. They're automatically going to know nine other people from their direct team. The winning team is going to win gold medals. Maybe they'll wear them at lunch that day. Maybe they'll wear them that night to the, the cocktail reception. We'll encourage them to wear them the rest of the three days to say, remind everyone that they were the winners. Good for them. Well, that's a, con a conversation piece right there. Somebody else might come up and say, we were robbed. Yeah, well, sorry. We, we got the medals, right? So it automatically creates conversation. And again, it was based on that fun competition factor. So during your experiences as well, one of the things that I've noticed through the work that you do, Matt, is that there is always a purpose behind what you do. So you mentioned kids for bikes earlier. So that's something that you use a exercise as a team together, but something that's also serving communities well. Just tell us a little bit about some of the things you do. Well, as far as the philanthropic experiences, yes, building bikes is for kids is one. We have an experience where we build wheelchairs for veterans, or maybe not even veterans, for, for people who are mobility challenged. Uh, foster care programs, kids entering foster care, uh, kids during that need snacks that don't get them during the work or the school day uh, when they're on vacation, places that they can go to get the snacks because they're they're underserved and maybe their parents can't afford to give them a snack every day. So. All of those types of things. Many companies have CSR, corporate social responsibility uh, initiatives. And if we can align with them, that's great because let's say, let's be honest, if we can get something out of it, i.e. getting our teams to work together, having fun, doing something out of the norm of the workday and give back, well, then it's win-win for everybody. Yeah, I'm taking all the boxes, right? Exactly. And it doesn't have to be philanthropic. It could be a culinary program and, and your company, I, I don't know, maybe your company makes salsa. We could do a, a salsa margarita challenge. See, oh, wait, maybe that is the next new recipe for your brand, right? Or for a, an alternate version of your salsa. Or maybe you make pasta sauce and, well, great, let's use your sauce in this culinary team building experience. So there are ways to incorporate the company as well yeah exactly love it so have you ever had a time where you've just had a participant who's just you know folded arms stuffy and i'm not getting involved in any of this have you ever experienced any of that yes <laughs> how, do you, how do you deal with that to be honest with you i don't and i'll tell you i'll tell you why usually well it's never not happened so knock on wood the person ultimately says, well, I look like a schmuck standing over here and I'm the one who's not having fun. And it, it, who wants to be in the corner, right? All by him or herself. If your colleagues bring you in and you insist upon being that stuffy jerk, okay, fine. You're only hurting yourself. So peer pressure, I guess, is, is the bottom the bottom line. And I, I say that in a positive way, not a negative way, that ultimately your peers are going to say, come on, let's go. You're being a jerk. <laughs> and, and it happens, right? If, if somebody doesn't have the realization by themselves that they're, they're only hurting themselves and look like a dunce, the, somebody else or 
several other members of the team are going to say, come on, let's go. Now, I like, I, I'll be patting myself on the back. That rarely happens because our experiences are designed in such a way that you really can't sit out starting right at the get-go. And when I facilitate and our other facilitators have been trained to really put, put on the charm immediately, put on the energy immediately. So we inherently, or not we, but the participants inherently say, okay, I'm, I'm already in this. The one thing I notice in those experiences as well is the other thing, of course, is that that individual is looking at everybody else having loads of fun, thinking, no, I'm losing out. Correct. So I know over the last couple of years, Matt, you've had to really pivot your business model as we were going through the experiences of the pandemic. But I wonder, having had the experience of being face-to-face -face and virtual, what the pandemic's really taught us about how we participate or get involved, if the case, around things like team building or activities. What's it really highlighted for us? Well, I think that it's proven to us that face-to-face -face interaction is necessary, and it's certainly good for us. We learn so much more, and we get and give so much more when we're face-to-face. -face. When you're on a video call, you yes, you can see the person, but you may not see the person's hand gestures because the, the camera is close, right? And you don't get the body language. You don't get the, the nonverbal cues. You don't get touch, right? We, we human beings need touch. There's a wonderful book and it's old and it was Tuesdays with Maury, Mitch Album. And uh, there was a movie made with Jack Lemmon and Hank Azaria many, many years ago. And I'm paraphrasing here, but Maury was diagnosed with ALS, and he basically taught this former student, Mitch Album, life lessons. And one of them was, when we come into this world, we are cradled by our mothers, right? Until we learn to walk, and even then, we are constantly cradled by our parents, craving human touch. When we die, we want some, nobody wants to die alone. I know this is a, a, a grim thought and i apologize for for doing that on the podcast but it, we don't nobody wants to die alone right so we want we crave it but why do we set why do we push it away for the majority of our lives why is why do we begin and end with it but not continue to make it so important to us during our adult lives but again going back to face to face handshakes now, I know people are, are still, some of them are nervous about that and whatnot. Okay, then do an elbow bump, whatever. But when you touch someone's hand and you grasp it, you are having a physical connection that you don't get virtually. Yeah. Now, virtual team building experiences and other were very valuable. They still are. We do them. We, I personally prefer face-to-face. But I know a lot of people are saying we're just not ready to go back yet or we don't have the ability to bring in everybody just yet. We've got it six months down the line, but we want to do something right now. Great. So it's it's still valuable because you're getting people interacting and hopefully having fun. But the face to face in person is just so much more valuable. And before the pandemic, would any yes, people were doing virtual events. I get that. But. This wasn't even in our our brains, right? As a thought, this conversation right now, right? It's like because of the pandemic, we have so why? Because of the pandemic is why we're having this discussion. But again, going back, I'm not sure. I can't articulate this. I don't know why. But going back, we never would have thought about that. Before. That's true, and it's fair to say I think that people, certainly in my experience, in the last three to five months, I would say, are really grateful in when people come together as a group there's definitely mm -hmm. much more appreciation for that now yes it's not just well we're going to a sales meeting it's oh my gosh we're going to a sales meeting <laughs> live and in person <laughs> and and therefore there's something deeply intrinsic that you referred to as that kind of cradling that is a also a very real metaphor for us wanting connection with people isn't it yeah and when we're in face to face we I, at least in my experience, observe people being more uh, organically involved, 
right? When you have a computer screen behind you, how many times have we seen somebody looking down and we say, oh, well, he or she is checking voice uh, text messages right now. Or, you know, or, oh, well, he's reading his email. We can tell. What, you're not as engaged because you have so many more distractions and there's no real accountability either. That's right. And I don't use that as a negative term. I use it as a positive term. Even to ourselves, we're just not accountable because we have so many other things right in front of us on that fancy screen that when you take that away and what's in front of you is an actual face, oh my gosh, okay, I'm totally engaged with you right now. Well, fingers crossed for wherever anybody is listening to us in the world, they're going to get back to some level of connection and normality pretty soon anyway. Yes, I hope so. So this part of the show, Matt, is where we start to turn the tables. You've led lots of different teams and had lots of different leadership experiences over your career. And I'm keen to really hack into those now. So what I'm going to ask you to do, if you can, is try and think of all of those experiences and just distill them down to your top three leadership hacks. What would they be? Uh, One is to utilize people's strengths. And that's not only participants, but also staff and facilitators, right? We, in an office setting, in an assembly line, in a factory, whatever, we hire people based upon their qualifications and skills. So let's do the same thing in a fun atmosphere. Now, again, this is going back to what I said before, maybe let people get outside of their comfort zone, but at least for me with staff, I always want to find the right staff person for the not only the experience, but the client. Right. Is there what's the demographic of the client who is going to work best with that demographic? So that's one utilizing people's skills and strengths. Uh, another is my my catchphrase is regress to kindergarten. Take off the sport coat, take off the tie, take off the high heels, whatever you're wearing. Have just go. No, you're in a safe space. Nobody's judging you. If they are, judge them right back because they're probably doing the exact same thing. It's not going to go anywhere. It's kind of like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What happens in this room stays in this room because if you don't have those uh, inhibitions, you're going to organically be uh, in a much better place to give of yourself for your team and the experience. And the third leadership hack, geez, I would say it's really kind of my new catchphrase is, take the fear out of team building, which is the title of the book. And that is, let's give people experiences where at the end of it, they say, if, okay, so my goal is when, when you see me walk in six months from now, you're not going to go, oh, that team building guy. You're going to hopefully say, ooh, what are we doing today? Or at the very least say, all right, let's see what he's got up his sleeve today. Let's see how it compares to last time. Mm. There must have been some magical experiences you've had over your careers. If you could just maybe call one out, the, the most fun, extravagant experience that you've had with a group or an individual in a group, what would that be? Um, it's hard to pinpoint one. Uh, I And I can't remember the exact number. I facilitated a uh, military care pack program. This is probably seven years ago or more. Those always get me. Um, I'm a big supporter of, of the U S military. I, I know you're over in, in Europe, but I'm a big supporter of people who put their lives on hold to make our lives better. Absolutely. So I am a, I, that is very important to me. So military care pack programs always hit me, um, uh, pretty, pretty tough or pretty they they give they hit me hard uh, in a good way. I also, when you see a kid who is part of a boys and girls club or whatever, come into a room and they don't know why they're there. And then all of a sudden there are 12, 24, 50 bikes. And they're then told these are going to your organization. The look of, huh, on their face is just, is amazing. And little ones are just, I have, I don't have kids. I'm too old to start at this point, but boy, some of the things they do and say, they just melt my heart and make me just crack up. <laughs> and I Makes it all worthwhile, right? Exactly. I'm always appreciative for that. 
Well, the next part of the show, we call it Hack to Attack. So this is typically where something hasn't worked out for you. Maybe been pretty catastrophic, could have screwed up. But as a result of it, you've learned and it's now a force of good in your life or work. What would be your Hack to Attack? Um, <laughs> be careful what papers you sign, to be quite honest. <laughs> yeah. Really? And um, be careful with whom you, you go into business and protect yourself because you're the only one that's going to protect yourself. And I, I don't want to sound cold and, and snarky, but it's true. There's, you can be a wonderful person and be very giving and loving and generous and still protect yourself. Yes, you can. Um, and, and that's the business side of me. Careful what you sign and know who you're getting into, into bed with proverbially. Yeah, you're not the first guest, mind you, to have said that over the two <laughs> two years or so we've been running the show. We must have had at least half a dozen of our guests have, you know, some really similar circumstances where with the greatest trusted relationships have gone wrong because of one piece of paper. Exactly. Exactly. And it's yeah. sad that that, that that happens, but it's the reality of, of the world we live in. It certainly is. Now, the last thing we're going to do is you get to go and give yourself some advice at 21. So if that time travel happened now, you were stood right in front of Matt. He's 21. You're in front of him. What's your advice? Probably to embrace the opportunities that you're presented with wholly. Don't be fearful of them. Everything, I, I, again, hindsight is twenty twenty. The older I get, I do subscribe more to the philosophy of everything happens for a reason and for, for whatever reason right now this is where you're supposed to be and it may not be the happiest of circumstances but what do you need to do to not only get through this but thrive beyond it and learn from it great advice that's the other that would be my two words it's okay hmm. love it so what's next for you and the team well, we are, are very excited to be getting back to face-to-face -face experiences, uh, really trying to, to provide those to people who are ready. Uh, I hope more and more people continue to be ready and, and jump on this. My hope is that now companies who are allowing people or have just made the decision to, we're not going to own real estate or rent real estate anymore because we know work from home works for us great. That money that you're saving, bring your people together at least twice a year. Quarterly is better. Have an all hands. Even if it's just lunch, an address from the CEO and a team building experience where people get to play and work together hands on, do it. It's more important now than ever. And I hope it becomes, my, my dream would be that it becomes instilled in everyone's minds that this is, this is as important as ordering copy paper. Right. DNA and the fabric of an organization should have all of those experiences to really exploit some of those unlearned or unobserved behaviors that you talked about earlier. Right? Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So when folk have listened to this, Matt, where's the best place for us to send them so they can bump into some of the work and maybe get a copy of the book? Uh, the, the best place is the website, which is premierteambuilding.com. It's premier as in like number one without the E at the end of it. But if you do happen to put it in, it'll direct you to the correct place. There's a contact form there. There's links to Amazon where the book is. Uh, all of our social media links are there. You can follow us there. And we, uh, I love to travel personally. So we do programs throughout the US, Canada, Mexico, abroad. I'd love to get over to the UK at some point. So more than happy to do that for anyone who's listening over there. I'll bring the cool charm over. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, Matt, listen, I've loved chatting to you and, you know, there's no surprise that you've been a success in the business that you're in and the energy and focus that you bring to it. So I just want to say thank you. We'll make sure all of those links are in our show notes. So when folk have listened as well, they can dive straight over. But thanks for being on the show, Matt. Thank you, Steve. I want to sign off by saying a thank you to you for joining us on the show too. We recognize without you, there is no show. So please continue to share subscribe and like and continue to get in touch with us with the great news stories that we share every week and so that we can continue to bring you great stories please make sure you give us a five-star review where you can and share this podcast with your friends your teams any communities 
you want to find us on social media you can find us on facebook and twitter at leadership hacker leadership hacker on youtube and on instagram the underscore leadership underscore hacker and if that wasn't enough you can also find us on our website leadership-hacker.com tune in to next episode to find out what great hacks and stories are coming your way that's me signing off i'm steve rush and i've been your leadership hacker